What's good everybody, Finder Bub here. Thanks for checking out the video. Today we're talking about planning and how to make your Iceland trip more affordable. and welcome back to the Iceland Travel Series. If you missed last week's video about why you should travel to Iceland in the first place, you can click or tap right there for that. Otherwise, without further ado, let us begin. Pew! The low cost of the flights was one of the main reasons we chose Iceland as the destination for our trip. One round trip ticket from Boston to Reykjavik only cost me about $300 US, but unfortunately that is where the deals stop. One of the first things we noticed after doing a little bit of research was how expensive it would be to actually travel around the country. The prices are marked up like crazy. I'm not an economist. It's gonna be a lot of disclaimers in these videos, just so you know. I'm not an economist, but I think that it probably costs a lot of money to import things to an island in the middle of the ocean. Despite the reason why the prices were so high, it was something that we were gonna have to deal with and factor into our planning. If you've watched any of my other videos, you may have seen the Thailand series. This was the exact opposite of my experience in Thailand. In Thailand, everything is so insanely cheap that it's easy to justify a month-long trip when you have nothing planned because you don't have to worry about running out of money. As long as you budget a certain amount, you're probably good. I was way under budget for that trip. It was a month of basically deciding what we were gonna do the day of. If you wanna learn more about the Thailand trip, I'll leave a link down below. There's like a playlist and I have a few more videos that I'm working on for that, but I wanted to switch gears a little bit, do some Iceland stuff because yeah, it, the footage is a little better. Plus we all have to move on in life, don't we? Iceland is a different beast altogether. We knew right away that we would have to carefully plan each of the 10 days that we were gonna be gone for so that we could make sure that we wouldn't accidentally get stranded with no money or anything like that. It's not like we didn't wanna check out all the expensive stuff. Personally, I would have loved to try all the fancy restaurants and return home to my fair lady with woolen pelts from a faraway land. Yeah. But <laughs> We're just four average dudes in our 20s just trying to make the most of the opportunities we have So that just wasn't an option. It's really easy to overspend if you're not careful Especially in countries where things are much more expensive like Iceland We knew this trip was going to require a careful and considered approach There are reasons we went to Iceland in the first place And we wanted to make sure that those priorities were at the top of our list because you know We didn't want to show up there and spend a bunch of money in the first few days and then not have enough money to do the things that we specifically went to Iceland to do so first we tackled the priorities. One of the main reasons we wanted to go to Iceland in the first place was to see and walk on a glacier. None of us had ever done that before, so it was definitely at the top of the list. We shopped around online a bit and we found a very well-regarded guide company and we booked their cheapest tour, which ran us about $100 per person for a half day trip tour hike thing. That was the first thing we did. Another thing we wanted to check out was the Blue Lagoon because that's such a popular tourist destination. We booked our entry in advance. We got the basic entry pass to the spa, which was a little over $70 US per person. The basic pass gets you a locker and access to the hot spring pool, but it does not cover a towel. So just keep that in mind if you're booking the cheapest package that you have to bring your own towel. And we did not. It was uh, a little chilly when we got out. Don't forget to bring a towel. I generally travel with a quick dry pack towel that I just got from REI. They pack down pretty small, so it's worth having one of those in your bag. It would have come in handy there, but I had left it in the car anticipating that I was gonna get a towel when I got inside. Most of the other things we wanted to do didn't really require any advanced booking. We wanted to get the things we knew we wanted to do out of the way before we got there. We were considering taking a fishing tour where they like take you out on a boat and you go deep sea fishing. You can also go trout fishing and salmon fishing in some of the rivers and stuff, but it would have taken up a whole day of our trip at least. And it's not like we couldn't do that at home if we wanted to. So we decided against the fishing tour, maybe next time. Something I'd love to do, but you know, it was a 10 day trip. We were trying to pack in as much as possible. We wanted to get as many unique Iceland experiences as possible. So fishing trip was out. Despite the fact that Iceland's a really small place, there is a ton of stuff to do there. So it's easy to waste a lot of time driving back and forth to different places if you don't plan it out in advance. 
And the second thing we did after tackling our priorities was to plan our route. We knew we were gonna have to rent a car because it just costs way more to like have a tour guide or like actually hire someone to bring you around. We knew that the rental car was gonna be one of our major expenses. Iceland has all of these roads called F roads and those roads are inaccessible by cars that don't have four wheel drive, even in the summertime. Our first thought was to get an SUV with four wheel drive or all wheel drive that had some, you know, off-roading capabilities like a Jeep or whatever. It's another big price jump from just a regular rental car to an all wheel drive car. So we were sort of disappointed when we found out how much more expensive the four wheel drive cars were. Immediately that was out of the question. That was pretty disappointing, but that also sort of solidified the places that we would try to go to. You're not allowed on the F road with a regular car that doesn't have all wheel drive. So those areas were off limits to us and we focused our efforts on planning out what we wanted to do in the areas that we could access with a regular car. There isn't snow there in early September or anything like that. So it wasn't such a big deal that we didn't have an all wheel drive car. It wasn't really a safety risk or anything, but it just limited what places we could access. Why are they called F roads you might ask? No idea. Probably because they'll F up your car. See, Iceland has one main road, Route 1, AKA the Ring Road that hugs the coastline all the way around the island. There are a bunch of little offshoots to various places of interest, but the ring road was going to be our main route. These are regular roads, well paved in most places. So the car we rented had no problem. Our car actually had a big sticker on the dashboard that was like, do not go on F roads. We wanted to go on the F roads, but it would have avoided our insurance and yeah. We uh, weren't gonna take that risk. So we stuck to the coastline for the most part and the areas around the ring road, AKA route one. And maybe in the next trip, we'll go to the highlands. Our next budgeting decision definitely made the biggest difference in the cost of our trip. Iceland has a ton of public campgrounds all over the country that cost pennies compared to a night in a hotel. We decided to turn our road trip into a car camping road trip. Just by avoiding hotels, we saved so much money. Now I know not everyone has camping gear and once you start to add up the cost of sleeping pads, sleeping bags, tents, cook sets and stoves and gas and all those things, things start to get pretty expensive expensive. However, I'd argue that you can easily waste a lot more money on a night in a hotel. Whereas if you spent that same amount of money on some camping gear, the investment will go a lot further than just one night. If you buy a tent, you'll have it for a long time. You spend money on a hotel for one night, it's one night, it's done. There are all different levels of hotels and hostels and places you can stay that cost a varying range of prices. So if you're the type of person who needs a little extra comfort or who's looking to experience more of a fancy vacation you can definitely do that in Iceland. There are tons of fancy hotels, there are tons of fancy restaurants, they have a ton of stuff there. So if you uh, don't feel comfortable camping, then you can definitely stay in hotels. It's just gonna cost you a little bit more money. For the full list of gear that we brought with, be sure to check out the full article at finerbub.com slash Iceland. So the flight that we booked was due to land in Reykjavik late at night. And so one of the other things that we booked in advance was an Airbnb for that night and the night after. So we could get there and then just crash, not have to worry about where we were going and then wake up the next morning, do whatever we wanted to do in the city, see what we wanted to see, and then spend the day stocking up on groceries and other supplies for the camping trip. And then that way we could go to bed at night and then wake up early the next morning to start our road trip. We also booked an Airbnb near Akureyri, which is like this town in the north, so that we could do laundry halfway through the trip and you know maybe charge whatever batteries that we needed to charge. I'm not gonna pronounce any of these names right, so just like bear with me if you're from Iceland comment below with like the phonetic pronunciations. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just gonna sound it out as I learned from Miss Shamban first grade. Thank you Miss Shamban. You taught me to read. The Airbnbs were a lot more expensive than the campsites, but they were a lot cheaper than the hotels. So it was really easy to justify staying there. It was definitely worth spending that amount of money for the few nights that we got to spend indoors. If you want to go to Iceland, but you don't want to shell out for the camping gear, and you also don't want to shell out for the hotels, and you maybe, you know, don't feel so confident camping, then Airbnb is definitely a good way to go. Just know it's going to run you a little bit more than the campsites. So other than that, we got two prepaid SIM cards with like five gigabytes of data each. That cost us 
us like $55 US total. Keep in mind that if you're ordering a SIM card, you also need an unlocked phone. We only had one unlocked phone out of the four of us that were there. So what we ended up doing was just having one phone with a SIM card in it that would bring in the data. And then we use that Wi-Fi hotspot feature to give everyone in the car Wi-Fi. I'd also suggest going on Google Maps on your phone and downloading offline maps before you go. There are a lot of dead zones. Even if you have an Icelandic SIM card, you might not get service just because there's mountains and things like that that will block your signal. If you're going around the ring road, it is a straight shot around, but there are lots of like little offshoots that take you to the various points of interest. So it's good to have a GPS or a phone with GPS so that you can properly navigate. But if you download the offline maps on Google Maps, then you won't be using Using any data to retrieve that so you can save the data for like you know facetiming your family or uploading photos or things like that sim cards came in handy but definitely download offline maps as well that's pretty much all the money we spent before we left the rental car ended up being our largest expense by far but that's only because we didn't stay in any hotels we didn't have to buy any of the camping gear we owned most of it and then borrowed whatever we needed from other people that we know if you have your own camping gear and you like to camp, it's definitely the way to go. And I would argue that it's definitely worth investing in camping gear, even if it's just for this trip, because if you really like it, you'll want to go camping again and you'll already have all the gear and you want to spend that money again. So now I want to talk about what sort of things you guys can take away from this video if you're planning your own Iceland trip. Number one, definitely take advantage of the Airbnbs and the campgrounds. Number two, buying groceries is a lot cheaper than eating in restaurants. Number three, I would definitely say don't pay for an SUV if you don't need one. Number four, get a SIM card. It's not that expensive and it's definitely worth it. If you go during a cold time of the year like we did, definitely rent a car that has butt warmers. It's a huge lifesaver. Alrighty, I hope you guys learned something from this how to plan and budget your Iceland trip video. If you think you might enjoy some more video content of the sort, consider subscribing, joining the other 24 or so people who have subscribed to this channel. If you have any tips on budgeting or planning that I didn't mention, I'd love to hear about them, so please leave a comment below. But before you do, I just wanna say thanks so much for watching, really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video or got something useful out of it, be sure to share it with your friends or anyone else you know of that is thinking about taking a trip to Iceland. For more information on the locations we visited and all the gear we brought with, be sure to check out the full article at findabub.com slash Iceland. Alrighty, my people, once again, thank you oh so much for watching this video. Really do appreciate it. If you're planning your next trip, don't let the small details stress you out. Remember, life's an adventure, so relax. Breathe in the outdoors, and don't forget to appreciate the finer things in life. See you out there, people.